Welcome to Black Health Matters. I'm Daryl Armistead, your host. This episode is a Zoom recording of Howard University group session led by Dr. Clive Callender. Oh, for those for those who uh, like the raw city food, it wasn't very isn't very uh, thought of as a good idea, but uh, seafood in general is thought to be safe, but the the raw seafood is not. Uh, many of you like sushi? Nope, I don't. I, I do. I love it. And uh, I love it. I eat uh, oysters on a half shell. Yeah, you talk about oysters and uh, other raw softens uh, and how important it is to get it from safe places because it has so many uh, bacteria if it's not treated properly. Sushi and kumshi. Uh, are you okay. ready, Doc? You want me to? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Trying to share. Oops. I don't want to. I guess we could start with this. Okay. This is a uh, uh, video that talks about how in the future, uh, and this, for some today, uh, uh, and for some things, no open brain surgery is required with the, the computer interfaces. Uh, of course, uh, and they were in, uh, now we're talking about computer surgery in the abdomen and uh, gynecological areas and uh, on the back as well as many surgeries. So it's expanded even to the brain where uh, uh, stereotactic and other devices allow for the ability to have a brain surgery without it, without it being open. It just doesn't mean you don't do the surgery, but they, they do it in a very uh, novel fashion. Okay, here uh, we go. Let, let, let me know if everybody can hear it. This device is made to be inserted into yep. the brain. You can hear it. People living with paralysis to. Sorry. This device is made to be inserted into the brain, allowing people living with paralysis to control their phones, computers, and beyond using only their thoughts. I can talk to you with my thoughts. We visited Synchron, the company developing this technology, to learn about how it works, how it gets into the brain without open brain surgery, and what it's like to use. Let's check it out. The dream of controlling computers with brainwaves, known as a brain-computer interface, or BCI for short, has been around for decades. So far, most of these technologies have primarily stayed within the domain of clinical trials and studies, especially when it comes to devices that are actually implanted inside the skull itself. Synchron aims to change that. Synchron is bringing electronics into the brain in a minimally invasive way, and it's going to be useful for brain-computer interfaces, for brain monitoring, for brain mapping, and for brain stimulation. Synchron says it's been able to get around the need for open brain surgery by building off of stents and catheters, pre-existing medical devices that enter the body via the blood vessels. We enter into the jugular vein in the neck, make our way up into the brain, and then the stent opens up over that area of the brain called the motor cortex, and it communicates wirelessly with the outside world to control personal devices. The resulting implant is called a stentrode, and the full system is called the synchron switch. Oxley demonstrated the insertion for us on a model brain used for training by doctors before they go on to perform the procedure on human beings. So I'm just gonna open this, then this is gonna go up through the jugular vein, up into the brain. Now we deploy the device. Tom said that the prevalence of cath labs, places where catheter-based procedures occur, creates a good jumping off point for the stentrode to become a more widely accessible medical device. Our philosophy for a BCI to be successful for a large number of people to be scalable is that it had to be simple. And one way to do that is to really simplify what you're looking for in the brain patterns. And in the part of the brain that we're in, there are aggregations of activity that represent attempted movement. The antennas inside the stentrode pick up the signals inside the brain, and the synchron switch transmits them wirelessly to perform the desired action. 
the simplest elements of control are point and click. Stare at it and think about moving for a long time and it'll start zooming in. Yeah, and release. So you made a click, your first click with your brain. <laughs> You're going to see videos of our patients using um, iOS to send health reports, to do text messaging in combination with other accessibility platforms like eye tracking. Getting back your ability to control a personal device can be hugely empowering. Like a traditional stent, the stentrode is made to remain inside the body indefinitely. The biggest risk of the procedure is that there can be a blood clot that forms inside the device when it's sitting inside of the blood vessel. But what happens over about a 90-day period, cells grow over the device and it incorporates into the wall of the blood vessel kind of like a tattoo. From that point on, the risk of blood clotting is much lower, but patients are still staying on aspirin after the device has been inserted. Mm -hmm. A common concern when dealing with any sort of internet-connected device is privacy let alone a device that can listen to and interpret your thoughts. The privacy concerns are real. If there was to be a privacy leak, at worst, it would be able to predict as a corollary the way that you were, say, moving your mouse on a screen. And there's a history of other implanted devices like cardiac pacemakers and cochlear hearing devices that also have privacy concerns. So in this field, it's highly regulated, and we work with the FDA to meet a very high standards. The 10th patient to receive the Synchron switch implant was the last required for Synchron's current round of clinical testing. And one more pivotal trial will be required before getting market approval from the FDA. We were the first company to enroll and now complete enrollment for a um, human implantable clinical trial. So it's a very exciting time. And the patients that we've worked with have been an inspiration. With a less invasive route inside the brain, Synchron's technology can open up a lot of other possibilities for treatment, monitoring, and beyond. When people have seizures, they have to go to their doctor and the doctor says, how many seizures have you had? And you can't actually remember when a seizure happened. So there is an absence of technology that monitors long-term brain activity. And then another big area is deep brain stimulation. And the first example was Parkinson's disease. So you see these videos of people having a brain implant, they switch on the device and the tremor stops. That typically requires open brain surgery. And so there is a need to look for less invasive examples of how we can control those sorts of conditions. And we think that the blood vessels are, again, a, an avenue that are going to provide treatment options where typically require open brain surgery. Oxley says the Synchron switch will cost between fifty dollars to $100,000. And he hinted that the company is working on integrating AI into its technology. We're really excited about the interaction between our switch system and open AI or ChatGPT type integrations. What other technologies would you like to see us feature on the future? Let me know down in the comments. As always, thanks so much for watching. I'm your host, Jesse Oral. See you next time with the fam. All righty. What do you think about that, guys? To me, it's a little scary because, <laughs> especially at, at the end, they were talking about uh, artificial intelligence being incorporated with that. And uh, I'm, I'm going to try to find something where it's uh, applied to medicine. Uh, 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 chat GPT, I, I know Daryl's heard about that, but it's, uh, it's available. I mean, you can go on your computer right now and uh uh tell it what you want and it'll it'll write a an article for you it'll write a, a love letter it'll write a song uh it's it's very scary <laughs> what <laughs> what can happen with it i mean kids are using it to to write papers for classes in school now yeah so, I yeah, I had a professor who complained about that because uh, everybody was doing the same thing and there's no no uh, individuality or ingenuity. It's just copying, pasting, which is the antithesis of what uh, education is all about. You know what? I have signed up for Chat uh, GPT, and um, you know they have some safeguards built in because. Um, AI can determine whether somebody is using AI. So that's how the schools are taking care of it. Oh, how, how is that possible, John? Chat GBT can 
can fact check. Yeah. Hmm. Any other thoughts? Um, my thought about this was about the clotting. You know, it said the, the chance of blood clotting. It seems like um, that would be the uh, hardest, toughest area to deal with a blood clot in the brain cells. How about the fifty to hundred thousand dollar cost? Uh, insurance will pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> you think so? Huh? Good luck with well, that. They pay for the think so. uh, they pay for the drug. No, it's experimental, so it's not. They're not gonna pay for it. Oh no, not yet. No, no. But the future is coming. That's what I'm saying. Well, we understand about the future's coming. Now, fifty to hundred thousand dollars is is a bit much. Yeah, but there's some and, people uh, have that money too, Doctor Kellum. Well, it's not not just having the money. It uh, the desire to be uh, to have something in your head that's uh, mm -hmm. uh, allegedly uh, thinking for you. You know, it's uh, kind of kind of uh, frightening. You know, they have the stereotactic brain surgery where they they uh, can actually uh, go in and do, do some surgery without uh, actually opening the skull. But but uh, this, where, where the, the machine kind of thinks for you or takes your thoughts, allegedly, and puts things into action is very scary. Any other thoughts on this, this brand new, uh, relatively new technology that uh, uh, takes advantage of your ability to think and does things without you having to speak. One of the things that came to my mind was, and I know Daryl won't like to hear this, but you could hook this thing up to change the channels on the TV. <laughs> That's right, yeah, yeah. You can do that, yes. Kind of expensive price to pay to do that, though. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Yeah, it could also open up uh, telepathy, where yeah. you have conversations with other people uh, strictly. You know, it's um, I'll have to be on the same Wi-Fi channel to talk to each other through your mind. Yeah, interesting. Frightening, though, at the same time. Any um, other thoughts? I think it would help psychiatry, um, help them deal with people and to help them to get thinking in a rational way rather than long years of therapy. Well, I didn't say that they do that. Didn't say that they do that, though. Oh, OK. I, I don't think I'd want any anything in my head that was going to pick up all of my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> You're not ready for that yet, huh? <laughs> I know why. Ready. <laughs> what about you, Elizabeth? Any thoughts? Uh, it's in one way, it's amazing. In another way, it's like, okay, not for me. <laughs> uh, I, I, would be, I, I would be concerned about, you know, the, uh, the, the driver of that device when you put it in, you know, if you make a wrong turn somewhere. <laughs> well, that's always possible. But uh, because humans are, but uh, well, I, it's not for everyone. No. I'm not ready for it either. So, <laughs> uh, but it's good to know that it's out there, and uh, we're we're making so many advances. You know, it's funny we make all these advances on one side, and the other other side you see what happens with uh, uh, us fighting each other and the wars that are going on, and uh, yeah, we we go. 10 steps forward and 20 steps backwards. So it's an interesting world that we have today. The, the nice element about it though, is that that um, thinking about Parkinson's disease and things like that, if, if they can cure that with, you know, that that is amazing. Yeah, the, the way it could be used for treatment is attractive, yeah. 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 Oh, this is an article that I, I thought that uh, uh, I should share, even though it was intended for Howard University Hospital. And it just uh, talks about uh, how things came to pass, just like uh, uh, we were talking about this. 
Soul Searches and John Buchanan and uh, uh, how that came to pass. And now this talks about the Apple computers and Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and how they uh, had trouble raising about $1,500. And uh, uh, with that became the Apple industry, which is multi-billion or trillion dollar industry. Uh, Hewlett Packard, uh, <clears throat> we know uh, they talked about a $538 cash investment. Uh, and uh, you can't even think about the billions of dollars and trillions of dollars that uh, Hewlett Packard has been involved. And then, of course, Subway Sandwiches uh, is the world's largest fast food company. 44,000 locations in 111 countries. And it opened its first shop as Beach Subway using $1,000 in seed money. Hmm. It's interesting. 17-year-old uh, uh, and uh, uh, PhD founded it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, amazing that you can dream uh, and your dreams can come to reality if you, if you believe in yourself. And so... Uh, uh, I think her sharing that is uh, good to inspire people that no matter how how down you may be, you can always get back up. And I thought I'd share that with you. Any comments or thoughts about how to get to the top and how to how to how to believe in yourself and uh, inspire others? Yeah, that was the, all those companies yeah. were built before uh, while the antitrust laws were in force. Now that they're not in force, you have the big companies that gobble up all the small startups and uh, steal their creativity. So there's uh, really been no major companies that have um, uh, come on the scene in the last 20 years. But that's what they do, exactly what you said, they you have great ideas, but uh, but of course uh, they pay well for it. I I know one person who got a billion dollars as a consequence of that. So uh, you you do lose your identity, but uh, they pay pay you well for it. Uh, so uh, capitalism has its strengths, but it has some great weaknesses as well. Any other ideas or thoughts on this? Thinking big. Well, I think uh, for our people and for um, people that are not giants, I think the technology world is the best thing that what has ever happened to any company because my company just has grown and it's all with the help of technology. Any other comments or thoughts? Well, it's it's interesting that uh, uh, if you dream it, you can do it, uh, but you have to believe in it and be willing to sacrifice. Now, I, I don't know who can uh, resist the temptation of getting a billion dollars for their creativity, uh, but uh, uh, it's kind of hard to turn down that kind of money, and and most people don't. I have a friend of mine, uh, Jerome Kennedy, who has kind of done just that uh, and uh, resisted the temptation for people to buy him out. Uh, but uh, the temptation is great. And they, they come at you with these large bundles of money, as uh, Dal had said, and they, they, they take away your creativity and use it and take it as their own. Uh, but uh, they do pay you for it, which is something that in the past uh, may not have happened. Any other thoughts on that? It's very uh, uh, dreaming big is still uh, something we can do, even though uh, uh, after you dream big and you get big and you want to get bigger and somebody comes and tempts you with a billion dollars, uh, uh, mm. <clears throat> it's it's still the dream is still there and the dream can still become reality, although it may be a different reality. Any other thoughts on, on that? 
<laughs> no? Okay. All right, we can go to the next one. <laughs> this, is, this is an interesting article that uh, talks about how uh, most of the ultra processed things that we deal with these days come from uh, cigarette giants who uh, use the money they made off of poisoning so many people to make other products that also poison other people. But uh, uh, <laughs> they uh, uh, talk kind of badly about them, but uh, still there's uh, much to say about the things that they've done. Uh, this is a philosophical point because uh, nicotine is uh, lethal and uh, some would argue so are ultra processed foods. Uh, but uh, be that as it may, they are extremely uh, popular and uh, particularly for people who aren't wealthy. And uh, this of course is the point. Uh, whether the uh, premature death and dementia and uh, heart disease are a consequence of that. Although at the same time we talk about that, people are still living longer or were until the pandemic is very. Any thoughts on uh, this interesting article that talks about uh, how uh, the giants of yesterday are still giants, even though uh, the nicotine industry has uh, suffered here in the United States. It's, it's still profiting in Europe and abroad. And so. One, one thing I get from this article is that you really don't know who is behind the foods that you eat. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true, isn't it? That's so true. Yeah. You never think they were the same people who started the lethal nicotine. Uh, but lo and behold, there they are. My, my thought, Dr. Callender, is that uh, they had a lot of money off of the the cigarette sales, and then, you know, they they got wise to the fact that they were killing people, and they, you know, a lot of lawsuits came as a result of that. You know, people dying from lung cancer. Well, and, and I don't so, think it's a matter they were killing people. I think it's a matter that they were they were, the lawsuits that you mentioned. And, See, that, well, that's the tragedy of it. They didn't do it because they were killing people. They do it because they were going to lose money. Right. That, that's the real tragedy of it. So, uh, but they, from what they're saying, they're still making the tobacco products, but not as much in the United States. But uh, I, it, I, I don't think that it's uh, uh, the comparison between the cigarettes and the ultra processed foods is is, is fair. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, I guess you can make a comparison, but uh, I, I don't think it's nearly as as deadly as, as smoking cigarettes. I don't know. What what, what do you think, Daryl? I think the data suggests that you're right, but uh, uh, it is. You know, if you, if you, the the reason it's problematical is because uh, you look at uh, the lifespan. Uh, when cigarettes were out and the lifespan was much lower and now we have a longer lifespan, but uh, the quality of the lifespan may not be the same. But I, I think it's a good argument. Darrell, what's your thoughts? Yeah, um, tobacco and sugar, you know, sugar is a primary ingredient in ultra processed foods. They're both extremely addictive. Uh, you know, we have an addict, we have an epidemic of diabetes in uh, first world countries, including America. Uh, so I don't know that. Well, right now, tobacco, uh, tobacco is, um, you know, look, looked upon badly in the United States. But um, 
It gets the bad press, but sugar doesn't. But they both deserve equally bad press. Any other thoughts on, on this subject, which is uh, interesting to uh, discuss because uh, 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 the data indicates that sugar uh, is associated, as uh, Daryl has said, with uh, high mortality rates. And uh, it also talks about the salt and sugar as well. And uh, uh, whether or not they're in the same category is uh, a matter of opinion, but uh, the data kind of uh, points to sugar as being a, uh, but of course, uh, I'm not so sure that the, the comparison of sugar and diabetes is, is accurate because it's not the sugar that causes the diabetes. It's diabetes that uh, uh, causes the inability to handle sugar. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, they are two potent uh, products that, uh, uh, and the addiction problem that we have with sugar and salt remains, as well as the addiction problem we have with other, other things. Any other thoughts on this fascinating subject? I have a thought. Uh, it this article seems to imply that the cigarette giants did this on purpose. That they, you know, bought these companies that were going to addict people on purpose. <laughs> you, you, you know, they they saw the the ship was going. Their ship was sinking, so they're going to you know switch ships. Uh, you know, yeah, with with intent. To ensnare uh, the the public, I I, I don't. I, it's hard for me to believe that. I don't buy that either. No. I, I really One thing this article makes me think about is the fact that the uh, tobacco makers had to find some way to pay the lawyers back. Well, all the <laughs> law people were like, they had to find a way. Uh, well, they had they had many ways, but all those billions they made. I don't, uh, I don't uh, feel sorry for that at all. Uh, whether whether they had malevolence in their minds or not, and I don't think necessarily they did, uh, but uh, the end result was uh, the premature deaths of many people. The other thing to think about is, and I think John, this is what you might be saying, that you know they are bent on finding addictable things because you can make more money if you can addict people. Any other thoughts on the subject before we change? I don't know. I, I don't really think I, I'm sort of with John Buchanan on the fact that I don't think they did it intentionally to to just switch from one bad idea to another bad idea. I think they would just uh, see, saw that the tobacco industry was going away from what the norm had been, and they were just reaching out to, you know, get another industry. And so, so far, um, that the food industry, they haven't been sued with that. So, you know. Well it's up to us to regulate how we eat, but just like okay. whether or not we smoke, but. The, the lawsuits against the tobacco intent. industry, they always found research by the tobacco industry to say that it was deadly, it was addictive, and they knew it, but they sold it anyway. Yeah. And right. so now that they're selling ultra processed foods, the same companies, you know, they've got the research, they knew before they sold it, that it was deadly, it was addictive, and they're in the a business of selling addictive products. It's a great business model. It makes money. You get people hooked. They're going to be repeat customers for life. And it's not a problem that it's an early life because they die early because you killed them. But tobacco companies, there, there are industries that are in the death business. They're death merchants. Any other uh, thoughts? Any, yes, any last uh, thoughts? Yes, uh, my thought is um, summed it up in one sentence. I saw a movie called Painkiller. Okay, that's the first sentence. And the last sentence is 
uh, I had a chance to um, hear Dr. Burton out of Meharry. He's out of Ma he's he graduated from he's a graduate of Meharry College, and he talked about that there was a study over twenty years where uh, they uh, it was it was a it was a group of, it was a dental group that did a study all across America over twenty years to show what happens to people teeth when they eat fast, when they eat these products. And it shows that when, when um, and they show pictures, the uh, people that had less sugar, less <laughs> processed foods had teeth like us. The people who had, who ate a lot of consumption of fast food, uh, their teeth was in a state of horror. So, you know, that's where I come in at. Any other thoughts on the subject? Okay, well, <laughs> the fact that it's very provocative is uh, important because uh, I think uh, uh, many opinions on it and, uh, and I think that's, that's important for us to really think about these things. Now, uh, this is an article that talks about uh, the way in which uh, research in Western Switzerland uh, enhance tumor cells. And you know, the new therapy, CAR T cell immunotherapy, uh, is uh, something that has uh, revolutionized the treatment of cancer. And one of the things they do is that they take the, the uh, uh, cancer cells and they uh, incubate them with uh, human lymphocytes. And then after they uh, modify the, the immune cells, they re-administer them to the patients and the patients often uh, uh, respond to the treatment. And this has been one of the major uh, ways in which cancer has been uh, uh, cured in some instances. And so what has happened is that uh, this is actually a new industry in which uh, our own bodies will respond to the cancer cells and do the things that are necessary to eliminate cancer. One of the things that uh, is uh, surprising is that we have our own uh, immune cells that actually prevent us from killing the cancer cells. And one of the things these these uh, therapies do is they knock out those our own autoimmune cells that are protecting the cancer cells, and so that uh, this uh, long-lasting immune, uh, which by the way the Nobel Prize was given to uh, them for in uh, nineteen in two thousand and. Uh, 18, I think it was. Uh, and uh, so this uh, this is the therapy that resulted in uh, uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, cure of his uh, relative. Well, anyway, he, he had that happened in 2017 and he's st still alive today, although the disease has recurred. Uh, but he's had seven years of, 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 of life as a consequence of this kind of therapy. And so <clears throat> this is something that many places are doing. The, the Nobel Prize was given to uh, in the United States for this kind of work uh, uh, that uh, uh, has been revolutionary for the treatment of cancer. Of course, not for all cancers, but for some cancers, breast cancer and melanoma and, and, and lung cancer as well. Uh, so that uh, we've been talking about the technology of, of uh, the in instruments that can interact with the brain. We talk about uh, mini surgery and uh, prosthetic surgery that uh, and robotic surgery. <clears throat> now we have this CART T cell that uh, takes advantage of our own cells that can mount an immune response and be given back to the patients. Now it's true that when it's given to the patient, they do have a lot of side effects. 
But when you think of the, the fact that cancer is lethal and that uh, and it, it, in many patients it cures the cancer, it, it seems like a worthwhile endeavor. So this is a kind of a, uh, a many talk about immunology, but immunology is and the fact that we have an immune system that protects us from foreign invaders such as uh, bacteria, parasites, and cancers. Uh, this uh, points out that uh, this is a, in a way a God-given immune system <clears throat> that uh, works, but in some instances it, uh, it needs to be helped by the so-called super immune cells. This is a complex article, but yet I thought it was something that we might try to reduce to its elements to, to help you understand how uh, the treatment of cancer has been, been uh, become revolutionary because of uh, our understanding of, 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 of immunology and the fact that these cells that, uh, that we have to protect us sometimes uh, backfire and they don't help us as much. And as a consequence, we've used instruments that take the cancer out connect them with our uh, immune cells, then those immune cells develop protective mechanisms that destroy the cancer and help us live longer. Anyway, that's an oversimplification of it, but it's an attempt for us to understand our, our own immune system and how it can be used to, to cure us from ills that uh, we ordinarily have not been able to overcome. You know, Dr. Yeah, one one of the hardest diseases uh, to cure over time has been cancer, and um, you know this article tells me that um, our own immune system is supposed to do a lot of things and protect us from a lot of things, but somehow or another, cancer got in because our own immune system uh, didn't really know how to deal with the uh, cancer cells. And as a matter of fact, it enhanced the growth of the cancer cells. Right. So anyway, I thought it was an introduction to an understanding of, of, of exactly what you said. Any other comments about this article? Yeah. Does, does it help you at all to understand how the treatment of uh, cancers is being modified uh, by these major breakthroughs? Yes, I'm. I'm wondering now. I got in this article. It said that um, the the new technology is um, taking care of the immune, our own immune system. I'm wondering, is it just the ones that protect the cancer cells, or would it would this kill? or keep our immune system from protecting other um, elements that... Um, as far as we know, uh, this, this immunotherapy uh, is directed to the cancer cells. Now, what, your question uh, unmasks an uh, area of ignorance that we may have. What are the downstream effects, mm -hmm. long-term downstream effects of this? So far, we don't know. As far as we know right now, and we haven't been doing it for too long. It's only been less than 10 years that we're successfully using it, uh, that there's no ill downstream effects of this therapy. But time will tell. It's just like uh, many people talk about the nicotine. When they first started it, uh, they probably weren't aware of the damaging effects of it. They later on learned about it, but because of the massive amounts of money they made, they they uh, put that as an afterthought. Uh, but uh, uh, this therapy is relatively new, and so we don't we don't know that it has any downstream effects that will harm us in other ways or harm other uh, immune systems. We do know that there are our own immune cells. Uh, that uh, uh, prevent our bodies from destroying the cancer. And so we do know that these uh, that this therapy overcomes that uh, obstacle. Uh, Dr. Calendar, um, I guess it was maybe 20, 
20 to 25 years ago, I was um, maybe 20 years ago, I was taking immunology training at, at the NIH. And, uh, you know, one, one thing that was fantastic to me was that uh, our immune system, they measured, could recognize foreign, anything foreign to us. And three trillion, they said three, there was a number they, they, they told us, it could recognize three trillion different surfaces on these um, invaders, any anything foreign, a antigens, you know, uh, to particles of dust, to pollen, to uh, back to all different kinds of bacteria and viruses. And it, it could recognize the surface structures. And, you know, that, that same concept is, I think, part of what they were able to, to apply with the uh, messenger RNA technology uh, to help fight COVID. But uh, 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 again, the cancer fools our bodies it, it, being able to grow and be part of us. You know, the cancer that develops in us, our bodies don't recognize it as being foreign. So that <laughs> that's that that's the big problem. So when when you turn that recognition off you know it it, ha it would have to be specific to that particular cancer because there's so many other possibilities yeah, and in many ways that's why transplantation is so remarkable because we're trying to do the the direct opposite we're, we're trying to prevent the immune system from attacking a, a foreign organ uh, and so that's why uh, the transplant uh, uh, science is uh, uh, unique as well. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions about uh, our immune system? Uh, and uh, in many ways, it's a fabulous immune system, as you pointed out. It's just that as we get older, our immune system becomes weaker. And as it becomes weaker, then the illnesses like infections and cancer become more likely to consume us. And that's what, in many ways, what these vaccinations do. They uh, heighten our immune responsiveness. Okay. If there are no other comments, let's move to the next one. Uh, this is something that... Uh, uh, we've we've known for some time, uh, and this is a, a studies that have looked over a number of. You can see here 686,000 people were studied, and those compared with non-vegetarian diets, uh, vegetarian diets were associated with much lower risk of GI tumors. Uh, and colorectal cancers and gastric cancers. Uh, so that uh, this is just more data and information uh, that uh, our diets can be uh, healthy or unhealthy. And uh, the price we pay for uh, unhealthy diets is uh, one, of the, one of the results is cancer. Okay, Daryl, you get a plus. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's 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 uh, interesting that uh, uh, it's one thing to know it; it's another thing to actually do it. And uh, so, Daryl has done it. So. Yeah, he uh, definitely gets a plus. That's, yeah. <laughs> he not only has known it, but he, he's done it and implemented it in real life. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, uh, tea drinking is long thought to, uh, 
be great. Uh, and whether it's lack of green tea and the consumption of it is thought to uh, uh, reduce it enormously, 51% in some studies. And uh, uh, other studies say it increased. So this, this study was done to uh, answer that question. And according to this work, uh, although we have different countries, they have different results. It does appear that uh, uh, the tea consumption is not linked to the development of cancer at all, but is often associated with a decrease in, in cancer. I don't know how many of you drink tea. Uh, welcome, Perlene, good to see you. I don't know how many of you drink tea, but uh, anyway, the green tea and black tea lovers can find some comfort in that. What about regular tea? <laughs> they only talk about black, uh, black and green tea. They don't tell you much about the regular tea. Mm. Now, this is an article that uh, points out that uh, Colon cancer is a subject that has been discussed for quite a while, and there are many ways of uh, screening for colon cancer. Uh, and colonoscopy is thought to be uh, the main, uh, <clears throat> main the main way we do it, but there. Are, Many other ways of cancer screening, as uh, uh, John Buchanan has identified, and, uh, and as a consequence, some people are afraid of in the colonoscopy yeah. because of the fact that uh, people can, uh, during the performance of colonoscopy, they can perforate the colon and they can have other complications that uh, will lead to their losing their lives. So. Uh, uh, it's important to get your patient involved in understanding uh, whether they should have a colonoscopy or they should have other colon screening efforts. And so uh, the patient should be involved in that discussion and, uh, and they should be offered the so-called less in invasive uh, uh, tests that can be done, and there are a number of them. I think uh, I think that slide pointed to uh, the other less invasive alternatives, which uh, there's colon, there's sigmoidoscopy, uh, there's blood, fecal occult blood test, and there's a fecal immunochemical test that can be done to check for bloody stools. And, uh, problem with, and there's also, we used to do them, Double conscious barium colon enema, uh, and the the major uh, item about this is that uh, colon cancer begins with polyps, and polyps take time to become malignant. And so, if you can find the precancerous polyps and remove them, then uh, cancer can be prevented. And so this is why uh, colonoscopy is thought to be uh, one of the best ways of doing it because you can actually look and see if you have polyps. If you have polyps, you remove them, and this is cancer productive. Uh, but everybody is not up to having colonoscopy, so they have other ways of doing it. And then, of course, uh, one of the things with the colonoscopy is to have the patient understand that uh, the procedure can be done with sedation uh, and uh, so you don't have any uncomfortableness during the procedure. In many instances, when you have the procedure, you're not even aware of it until afterwards. Uh, but in spite of this, uh, uh, one of the things that they may not talk about in this article, but is a factor 
is the medication that you have to take in order to clean out the uh, large intestine so that it can be clean enough for you to have a colonoscopy. And uh, while that is not discussed here, that is one of the one of the obstacles of some people getting colonoscopies more so than the colonoscopy itself, but the prep, the prep. And of course, they are having changes in the preps to make them more patient friendly. Uh, but uh, there's a little question that uh, uh, the concept is that uh, polyps beget cancers. And if you take out the polyps, then you uh, eliminate the likelihood of colon cancer. And so for people who have never had a colonoscopy, uh, uh, then the likelihood of, of polyps developing into cancer are there. And that's why uh, the patient should be involved in the discussions about the wise and fair wherefores of sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy, and other screening tests to eliminate uh, colon cancer. Dr. Kellner, uh it says that the the anesthesiologists use this this chemical propofol. That's what uh, I think. That's what Michael Jackson OD'd on. Is that true? Yeah. Or, was that Michael? Yeah, it's very effective. Or it's very effective. Yes, it's very effective when used properly, and uh, uh, that's what that's what anesthesiologists do. They use those drugs properly, and uh, as a consequence. You should have no pain during a colonoscopy, and uh, it should be actually painless. Um, but uh, it, it, it's important to talk to the patient about it and also to have the sedation that goes along with it. Uh, Dr. Calder, when I, my very first colonoscopy, I had, um, I, the, doctor asked me if I wanted to be asleep or not. And I chose not to be. I'm just wondering, do they still do colonoscopies now where you can remain awake? Yeah, if, if you choose to. Uh, but most of the time, Don't they sedate you. More. They sedate you. Most yeah. times they sedate you. Yeah. Most of us want to be sedated. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't. But it's your it's your option. Like, there are people who still who still select the option of uh, being awake. Yeah. Okay. I'm not one of them. <laughs> My doctor doesn't ask. You know, that first <laughs> one asked me whether or not, but my doctor now just puts you to sleep. It's automatic. Yeah. Know? Right. Mm -hmm. Any other comments about this article? The fact that colon cancer now is uh, being diagnosed under the age of 40 is uh, cause concerns. Definitely under the age of 50, but even under the age of 40. So. so it used to be after 50, you need to get colon after. Now it's after 40. Yeah. Also, um, the last colon I had, um, which was a year ago now, um, my doctor said that he could not see the upper, I think he said the upper part of my colon. And he told me to go to a hospital so they could do a, another procedure to look at the upper part of my colon. Um, I'm wondering if, if, if that procedure, it says a T, a CT, colonoscopy CPC. so I mean if they can do that why can't they do that for the whole colonoscopy well it's just not as uh, as effective as the colonoscopy uh, because the colonoscopy they, you see all the way throughout the entire colon up to the beginning of the colon which is the cecum which is small, small intestine begins at the end of at the beginning of the cecum. So you get a chance to look throughout the entire colon. With the CT colonoscopy, uh, you may miss things uh, that the uh, colonoscopy might pick up. So that's why the treatment of choice might be the colonoscopy, but uh, a backup might be 
if they couldn't get around, uh, for example, if they can't get uh, to the uh, past the spinning flexion, then you have not done a colonoscopy. And uh, until you have actually reach the cecum, uh, which is the beginning of the large intestine, uh, and cancer of the uh, transverse colon and the ascending colon and the cecum uh, could be there and you would miss that. So uh, your doctor's right in indicating if he couldn't get past the uh, transverse colon that you do need another procedure to, to see the entire colon to be sure that there's no cancer lurking there. Dr. Callender, is there a possibility and I, I kind of know the answer already, but uh, of having cancer in the small intestine. Yes, of course. Yes, they have cancer in the small intestine as well. It's just that uh, they're much harder to detect. Uh, as, you know, they must have about 30 feet of intestines, small intestines. Mm. Uh, and so uh, we don't have a way of, of uh, actually visualizing all. 30 feet of the small intestine. Although they do have a special uh, x-ray that uh, allows uh, you to take uh, a special uh, radio isotope and swallow it and it can go throughout the upper intestine, the small intestine and take pictures. Uh, but that's not Offered to everyone because it's it's uh, it's 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 not easy to do and its results are not uh, as good as colonoscopy. So yes, you can have cancer of the stomach and any part of the small intestine. It's just that uh, as you get older, the cancers that are common are uh, common in the large intestine. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about? Colorectal cancer. Okay. With the now, super cells up in this type of cancer. Say again. With the super cells help with this type of cancer. Not not as far as we know now. Now if with that cancer, they have chemotherapy that helps. And they have neoadjuvant chemotherapy that helps with that, but not the, uh, so far as we know, we have not used the immune cells for colon cancer. Now, pancreas cancer is uh, something that uh, we're having more and more of. Uh, and uh, what is the problem with pancreatic cancer is the, uh, once it's, it's advanced, it's very difficult to treat. Uh, and unless you catch it very early, uh, uh, the treatment is associated with a five-year survival rate of less than 20%. So uh, screening for pancreas cancer is not uh, as easy to do. Uh, computer CTs, MRIs, and other ultrasounds can be useful. Uh, but uh, this is among the hardest of the cancers to treat and to screen for. Uh, and so uh, how do you become high risk for pancreatic cancer? Well, if you have uh, chronic pancreatitis or you're obese or you have family history of cancer. Uh, and there are some uh, genetic diseases that have a predisposition to pancreatic cancer. And so, uh, and as you know, some people will get a study that looks at the entire body from head to toe with a MRI of, of sorts that looks for uh, cancers of all types. And so, of course, this is uh, thought to be expensive and most people don't elect not to do it or can't afford to do it. And so uh, for that reason, the screening 
uh, is, is not easy. Although we like to talk about the hemoglobin A1C or glucose tolerance tests, those are not really good tests to make a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. It's only the uh, MRIs and MRCPs that uh, give you a good chance of um, making a diagnosis of pancreas cancer early enough so that it can be cured. Hey, Dr. Kelly, I had a, a co-worker, I remember, uh, when I was at, at Spring on, and uh, he was very, very, very upset that his wife had just been given a um, diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. And within two months, she was dead. And then uh, uh, a year later, he got diagnosed with uh, pancreatic cancer, and he passed away as well. Um, are there any symptoms? I mean, what what would you know? That back pain. Back pain is uh, the commonest symptom. Uh, for some, it's jaundice, where your eyes turn yellow. Uh, but uh, back pain or stomach pain may be a symptom. Uh, and as you know, back pain is a common malady. And so uh, a lot of people have back pain and uh, some of those people with back pain actually have pancreatic cancer. So, but if your eyes turn yellow, that's a, a good sign of pancreatic cancer. And if you have back pain, mm -hmm. uh, they can take x-rays and find out whether you have pancreatic cancer or not. But uh, you're right, it is uh, one of the most untreatable types of cancer. Unless it's caught very early. If it's caught early, they have an operation that can and cure it if it is not already spread. Dr. Callender, um, there's a lot of talk about uh, catching cancer early. And so I'm trying to get a grip on what early is because you know you've got you've got particles you've got atoms you've got molecules you know what what is early what what do they mean by early it's not early in for pancreas cancer it's difficult to make an early diagnosis of pancreatic cancer because uh, the pancreas gland is is in the middle of the abdomen and it's uh, and if you don't have any symptoms, it's hard to uh, to study. And so uh, uh, making an early diagnosis of pancreatic cancer is more than a notion. Uh, so uh, unless you get a special x-ray, uh, picking up, making an early diagnosis of pancreas cancer is not easy to do. Yeah, I guess what my question is about, you know, similar to early detection of breast cancer. Uh, you know, I Not understand so. that uh, you can have uh, a, a tumor that, that's very, very small. And how small, I don't know. How small is, is early detection of breast cancer? How, you know, how, what is the, I don't know, I don't understand what early is. I really don't. Well, early means you you find it before it spreads. Uh, and uh, if you find it before it spreads, that is considered early. But uh, And if you find it after it spreads, it's nothing you can do. Uh, but uh, so early for breast cancer is different from early for uh, pancreas cancer because the breast is easy to feel and palpate. And so you can make an earlier diagnosis because it's easy to examine. On the other hand, the pancreas is deep inside the abdomen and it's hard to examine. And so to make an early diagnosis of pancreas cancer is, is not in the same uh, ballpark as uh, an early diagnosis of pancreas cancer. But are we because you can't see it, you can't see it, and it's, it's hard to, and by the time you get symptoms, it's no longer early. So in, in both cases, we're talking about um, minuscule 
tumors that at some point are benign and at some point they will turn to a malignant. No, 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 no. Cancer of the breast and cancer of the breast are, are, are cancers, period. Now, unlike the the uh, colon cancer where it starts off as a polyp, that's not the, the situation for uh, breast cancer or uh, pancreas cancer. Uh, we have no evidence that uh, uh, there are some predisposing breast conditions. Uh, and, and just like chronic pancreatitis may uh, be a plenary a predisposer to uh, pancreatic cancer. But uh, making a diagnosis of early uh, breast cancer is much easier because the breast is, is easy to examine, whereas the pancreas is hard to examine. So making an early diagnosis of pancreas uh, cancer requires you to have special x-rays. Okay, got it. Dr. Callender, uh, if you have like your annual physical, how would that uh, show up on your, would, would it show up on a blood test? No. Not likely to show up. Then. Unless you look for it, you're not going to find it. See, if you have some, if you have back pain or symptoms like that, you look for it and you get special x-rays and you can find it. But if you have no symptoms and you don't do special x-rays, and that's why people, rich people will get those uh, MRIs of the entire body once a year to see if they can pick up an early cancer that is 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 before it, it spreads. And you'll find that there are people who every year they don't get a MRI of the whole body to see if they have a tumor. And that's probably the only one of the ways in which you would make an early diagnosis of pancreas cancer. When when you say back pain, you mean across the shoulders or the middle of the back or lower back, like usually you, middle or lower back. Middle to lower back. Okay. Usually, yeah. All righty. Yeah, okay. Well, and that, that so I think it's, uh, <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, walking grapes and fishing. Uh, I'm not walking grapes and fishing. I've never fished, so I, I um, uh, one of the things about fishing, what I understand is that you, you get a chance to really meditate. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think that may be, you know, we, we've talked about the, the fact that when we talk about uh, good health, we omit the importance of meditation. And the one thing about fishing, you get a chance to really sit and, and think and it's relatively stress-free and very few things in life are stress-free. Fishing is stress-free. Uh, uh, walking, we know, is uh, great for your health. And, uh, it risks, reduce the risk of dementia, lowers your blood pressure, and improves your mental health as well. And uh, we just talked about the study about tea, and some people think coffee benefits you as well. And the studies are mixed about caffeine. But uh, uh, there's little doubt about uh, the uh, uh, walking. Uh, now, the fact that drinking two or three cups of coffee a day lowers the risk of heart disease in some studies is interesting. Grapes, uh, and then <laughs> some people think that eating grapes is, uh, is not only key to eye health, but key to health. Uh, and uh, so they recommend this, uh, uh, even over carrots, as they say here. And then uh, fishing, uh, as we had said, uh, uh, does improve your mental health. Uh, any of you fish? John Buchanan is a fisher. Yeah, OK. Uh -huh. What time do you go out fishing, uh, John? <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, fishing is not really about catching fish. <laughs> what is it about? 
Well, because while while you're doing it, you're out in nature, number one, a lot, and you get to, you know, enjoy being outside. You you mm-hmm. you feel the 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 sun, the sun's rays uh, on you, uh, and you're you're focused on, on you know waiting for that tug on on your line <laughs> and you know it's um i i don't agree that it's that it's uh uh stress free because if you're winding in and your line gets tangled there's a lot of stress with that <laughs> you take off all that tangled line and leave. <laughs> You know, so there, there's some technology that goes along with with fishing, but um, some of my my most favorite fishing is uh, uh, fly fishing because it's um, it's it's very technologically oriented. You know, you got this very tiny bug on the end of a very tiny line. And you know you you get to know that that that, that fish can see that, and uh, and go for it. And when when you make that connection, it, it's really uh, really awesome. So I recommend it. I recommend it. I... <laughs> okay. Any other, any other thoughts on the combination walking grapes and fishing? I'm gonna go with the fishing too. Um... My husband was saying, oh, yes, yes, all, all of while John was talking, because uh, he used to be a fisher. He doesn't fish anymore. But my other scenario is you can take anything to the extreme. I have a friend who is an obsessive fisher, and to the point that he misses his dialysis appointments. No, no. Because he's going fishing. Really? <laughs> yes. That's impressive, all right. So uh, you can, t- I, my message is you can take anything to the extreme. <laughs> <laughs> That's taking it to the extreme, all right. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Mm. Any other comments about uh, fishing? I, you know, it makes me I think of fishing. Is it, anybody golf here? Are you golf? I just started golf lessons and I'm 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 really bad, but uh uh I'm I'm getting a little better each time I, I take my lessons. I, I've never played a game before though. Oh okay. But that's that's bucket list. I've got mu- musical friends who are retired who, who golf. So Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I wanna, yeah. I want to hang out with them. Any comments about this article, uh, walking grapes? And any anybody want to say anything about the grapes? I love them. That's all I can say. <laughs> Can't eat too many of them. Yes, Daryl. Daryl, any thoughts about grapes? Oh uh, yeah, a handful. That's a good amount of grapes. People that sit around and eat, you know, uh, grapes all day. You're probably eating too many. Daryl, you have something else to say about them. The difference between seedless and seeded grapes. Yeah, seeded is, is always better. Seeded watermelon, seeded grapes. Because you remove the seed, you got a hybrid product. <laughs> you and I knew that was coming. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, well, um, now this is an article that we've talked about exercise ad nauseum and uh, I think uh, some people wondered uh, if that really prevents cancer you know we know it does many things uh, cardiovascular system and all that uh, but actually prevent cancer and this this is a study by the Lynch syndrome which is a genetic condition that leads to cancer at a very young age and so uh, uh, they uh, did an intervention of, of uh, uh, and, and then you can see the numbers are very small. Uh, and they looked to see if this would result in 
and increasingly uh, in the markers that uh, result in cancer and to see if the immune cells would be increased. And lo and behold, uh, they found that uh, uh, there was a, a reduction in cancer in more than 45 studies. And of course, MD Anderson is thought to be that and Memorial Hospital in New York, I thought to be the cancer centers of choice. And uh, most of these studies then identified the fact that uh, the cancer risk is decreased with, if, with exercise. Uh, I think this is something that uh, we thought was intuitive, but uh, the data from this study uh, kind of uh, help you recognize that uh, among the things that exercise does in addition to uh, making your cardiovascular system healthier, it also helps your immune system to be stronger. Now, they're arguing that uh, the fact that they did bicycle riding is more higher intensity exercise. And that's why uh, studies show that they reduce in the risk of cancer. And uh, we've had studies that show that that is good and bad. So, uh, but anyway, this study uh, indicates that this high intensity exercise resulted in uh, better immunity, which led to reduction in the risk of cancer. I don't know how many now. Of course, John, you still swimming? I do. Uh, I go three times a week. And yeah, that's great. I yeah, swim cause... for about uh, almost two hours, about an hour and a half. That's great. That's great exercise. That's one of the best exercises I know of uh, because you use so many different muscle groups. Uh, 40 laps. Huh? I swim 40 laps. 40 laps. That's wonderful. Wow. I swim over a mile. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Well, so there's so many different types of exercises that uh, can help you live longer. <laughs> the one thing is true that no exercise is... Uh, Not, in, not having exercise is, is a problem. And growing old without exercising is something that's harder to do. That, that 40 laps, John, is equivalent to a woman cleaning her house. <laughs> well, I clean the house too, so I get back. <laughs> you, you're doing great. <laughs> I get all, all the above, grocery shopping too. <laughs> you know, I, I was surprised if if you do grocery shopping, one one day I measured it was almost eight tenths of a mile in the grocery store. Yes. Yeah, I tell you, it's it's more than an ocean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I grocery shopping and uh, how many do, do planting and uh, uh, gardening? That's another good exercise, gardening. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I water my plants. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is a, a good article that uh, actually, I think John Taylor Moore Buchanan brought up last time we met that uh, as a consequence of now finishing the COVID uh, stream and now to the point where you only need one vaccination a year, allegedly. The need for having uh, cars documented that you've been vaccinated are no longer required. And the CDC uh, is not giving them out anymore. And so uh, the question is, how do you 
uh, keep your uh, record of your immunizations. And uh, your primary care physician might uh, help you with this one. Uh, because contacting your state health public immunization system is uh, not an idea that I would go along with. Um, because that presumes that uh, all of your information is given to them. And uh, any comments? How do you feel uh, about the fact that you don't, that your vaccination card is no longer necessary? And that you have to keep up with, your, you have to document your, your immunizations. You and your doctor need to document your immunization itself, actually. Dr. Callender, I'm keeping mine because I'm getting ready to um, go abroad and I want to have all my documentation with me. Um, so I, I um, matter of fact, I just got my COVID shot and my flu shot and I asked them for my record so I can have it with my passport and stuff. So anything happened, I'm covered. Yeah. Were you able to get an RS, RSV shot? No, they didn't. They didn't give me that one. Yeah, that you know, one of the problems with that is that all pharmacies don't have that, and uh, hospitals don't have it either. Many hospitals don't have it either. So uh, that that's the only thing that's lacking for the completeness of the vaccination, uh, because uh, RSV is something that it's older people as well as children. So all three should be uh, done. Any, let's go back to that article again. Uh, let's go back to the previous article. Yeah, so the question is, uh, how many of you, how, are any, anybody have an RSV vaccine other than, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Dr. Callender, this is Sylvia. My husband just had his. And I had contacted um, where I normally go, Costco, and they said in um, Maryland and in D.C. that you need a prescription from your doctor right now to take that RSV shot. Wow. But in, Virgin in Virginia right now, they were saying um, you didn't need your doctor's prescription. But right now in the district and in Maryland, they're saying you have to actually um, have a prescription right now from your doctor. I was like, really? oh, but my husband did did get the shot in Virginia and um, he had slight headaches and a little body ache, but other than that, it, it left him in a couple of days. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I have a niece in New York and uh, he had trouble getting RSV as well because the hospitals didn't have it and the, the doctor's office didn't have it. What, what's the age range? range for the uh, RSV. I thought it was like under 12 and over 62, something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's about right. That's about right. Yeah. So I think it's uh, desirable, but uh, one of the things is uh, it should be more available. I got my flu uh, shot two weeks ago and I got my COVID shot uh, uh, also recently uh, about a, a week and a half later uh, no no symptoms at all you know just you know slight pain where the where the shot was given uh, but uh, no uh, no bad effects at all yeah yeah I'm gonna get mine uh, next week yeah, I'm also traveling uh, out of the country uh, in a, in a few weeks. Tatum knows about this, and uh, so I'm I'm gonna have my shot record a, as well. I did not take my my card in with me to, to get the uh, get the COVID test, but uh, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna try to to take that in and have them updated just in case. Uh, John, That's you can you can go on that website, mm -hmm. and they now have a new section called immunization, and mm -hmm. you can print out all your immunization records. Oh, excellent, 
Excellent. Do you, do you have the uh, the the website? Can you put it in the chat? No, you just, you just go out on kp.org. You know, like you sign in. Usually oh, sign okay. in. Okay. Okay, and they have a section. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I remember seeing that. kp.org. Okay, Kaiser Permanente. Even though they're supposed to be on strike, did you hear about that? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. They're back on. Oh, okay. Back. But I wanted to ask Dr. Callender about the combined shot. I heard on the news about combining the COVID and flu shot into one shot. Have you heard anything about that? Yes, they, they, uh, uh, I forget which uh, pharmaceutical was trying to pass that through FDA. I think uh, but, Pfizer, but, but I'm not sure. No, it wasn't Kaiser. No, I said Pfizer. Oh, Pfizer. Yeah, it may have been Pfizer. Yeah, uh, but uh, I, I didn't know that whether the FDA had approved it or not. But I, I, I read an article about that as well, that they, uh, that their preliminary tests seemed to indicate that uh, things went well and there was no reduction in the vaccination of either of the above. So once once that gets FDA approved, then then the combined shot would be fine. Mm -hmm. The previous studies and identified that uh, uh, that was not the case. So, oh. so this this is uh, I, I read last week that uh, what you said was the case that Pfizer was pushing that through the FDA. Now, whether it actually came through it or not, I'm not sure. Okay. 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 All right. Any other comments about that? Now, let's. This is an interesting uh, article on the most accurate time to take a COVID test. And uh, it's interesting that they point out that it, you can take it too early and get confusing results. Uh, but the, they say the best time to take it is uh, the fourth day after you get symptoms, <laughs> which is, uh, in my opinion, kind of late. Uh, but uh, anyway, when they did, they tested at a variety of periods. And the first day or two, uh, there were a lot of false negatives. Uh, and so they said that the best time to do it is four days out. I, 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 uh, I understand that that's the time when it is more, more likely to be positive, but uh, uh, I, I see no reason why you uh, shouldn't take your test a day or two afterwards. And if it's positive, significant. If it's negative, it may not mean that you don't have COVID though. That's the only, only problem because you may get a false negative. And uh, they're pointing out that the uh, symptoms for COVID symptoms have changed. And I think we talked about that before and that uh, the sore throat is often the first thing and then the rest of the symptoms are similar, but the sore throat is probably the first sign of it. Anybody have COVID recently? One of my uh, good friends was in New York uh, and he and his, his band members, uh, it was a, a six piece band and five of them caught COVID. Did it start with a sore throat too? Yes. Yeah. I know when I had mine in November, it started with a sore throat as well. This is this this article is saying some of the same things. Uh, uh, although uh, I think that uh, as long as you stay at home, it's probably okay. But I think it's unwise if you having an infection to go go out, uh, even that, if your COVID test is negative. That picture right there, you don't want to see that. <laughs> 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 That's very scary to see that. Yeah.
By the way, when you went to your, to get your COVID test, you got it at the Kaiser or or the pharmacy. Yeah, at, at Kaiser. Oh, okay. So yeah, they have a record. Okay. Uh, y'all, y'all know y'all can order free tests. Well, they sent us free tests. Yeah. Actually, everybody should have received two free tests. It should be actually two two boxes of two tests. Yeah. Okay. Mine are coming today. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, this is a good uh, article to talk about how to avoid uh, during the surge that's inevitable, they say. And of course, uh, It's no surprise, none of the uh, first thing is you get the updated vaccine and the, the time you need to get it is before November. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and if you're age, they say get it now. Uh, it's interesting that comment about if you had a recent infection, wait uh, three to four months. Uh, yeah. Well, they say start before the winter wave takes off. That's usually in these November. So uh, carry a mask. It's, it's interesting that uh, I take a mask and carry it around, but as I go to places, you find you're a lone, lone ranger because nobody else is wearing a mask. Doesn't matter to me. <laughs> I and, got and the, and the, uh, and the, the grocery stores, uh, people are wearing masks. Other places, they don't wear a mask. But uh, grocery stores, it's amazing. I'd say about 30% of the people in the grocery stores wear masks. When traveling, what's most important is if you're flying in the airport, uh, in the airport, that's uh, you must wear a mask. We get on an airplane; the ventilation is great, so it's it's not as important. But in that airport, uh, there's no no protection there. Uh, masking risk assessment: If you're over 65, <laughs> wear a high, well-fitted, high-quality mask. Yeah, and I think that's what is is, is probably the best advice. Now, when you go to the outdoor activities, I don't know about that. Uh, then it says skip indoor dining. Restaurants and gym, gyms, the two highest risk categories. And in the restaurants, almost nobody's wearing a mask because they have to eat. And you can't eat with a mask on. So, so uh, what do you do about that, John, when you go to an indoor, indoor dining? Yeah, I'm going today. Uh, I have my mask on until I eat. <laughs> and as soon as I finish eating, I put it back on. <laughs> okay. That's all, all right, I how about the rest of you? Any of you doing indoor dining? I, I did notice that nobody else had a mask on. Right, but, I know. <laughs> At an indoor of, dining, man, nobody wears masks. A few of the wait staff might have masks on. Oh, really? Yeah. So far, the ones I've been to, it's absent. It says avoid large group events. Uh, <coughs> ba baseball games, basketball games. If you if you go to them, you need to wear a, a mask. If you're indoors, if you're outdoors, I, I'm I'm not worried. Yeah, I'm not as worried either. But of course, basketball is indoors. Good hand hygiene, washing for 20 seconds is still the thing to do. <laughs> don't don't get complacent. It's hard not to get complacent. You know, thing about it, the place that is the least safe is the hospital. Uh, hmm. And uh, hospital no longer requires masking. 
And that's the place where you're more likely to get it. Oh, the Novavax COVID vaccine will soon be available. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is uh, they use the uh, DNA. Oh, the Okay, yeah, they use a protein. Hmm. It's amazing, as you, as you know, the uh, people who developed the RNA uh, technolo technology won the Nobel Prize this year. And uh, so uh, protein-based vaccines had been the norm, but uh, of course, uh, How many people have gotten the Novax, Novavax, Novavax vaccine? I think most people got the Moderna or the Pfizer, I suspect, because the uh, no, Novavax took longer to do and came out later than the others. It says it doesn't matter. You may have less of a reaction after the Novavax vaccine. Well, since nobody, so has anybody had a Novavax vaccine on this call? I guess no. No, everybody got the Pfizer and the Modernas. Okay, here's the last one. I think this is uh, clear that you need both. And I remember we had mentioned that uh, for the COVID, if uh, by now though, uh, insurance, even for those who have no insurance can get the COVID. And this gives you the history that we discussed before about how the bivalent vaccine, which was in favor, is now obsolete. And uh, that uh, this booster is one that's supposed to last for a year. It's supposed to. We shall see. CDC says RS vaccine is safe to receive. Uh, <laughs> whether you give them together or not, and I think uh, until I actually see, see it FDA approved, I would take them separately. Okay, well, that's the last article. Okay, any uh, comment, because it's, it's over 10.30, uh, any any closing comments? If not, thank you for participating and attending and giving your opinions. Good to see Pearlene again. I haven't seen her in a while. Even though I saw her in person, which was even better. Uh, but uh, yeah. One thing about Pearlene, she's always nursing. <laughs> always. We, we have a new member. Chris. How you doing? Chris is joining us for the first time, but he's late today. So, Oh, Chris. Oh, hello, Chris. Welcome. Chris, Chris is a uh, liver transplant recipient. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Wow. When did you get your liver, Chris? He's muted. I don't know whether he knows it. Yeah, okay. Oh, by the way, uh, Ken, Kevin's funeral is uh, who? Sunday. Sunday. Sunday, yes. 
Um, Who's that? Kevin. Kevin Sullivan. He was a regular attendee. Right. Uh, oh, the white guy. Yes. Yeah. Oh, he's, yeah. Yeah. He was waiting for a liver transplant, and uh, oh my, he had, he had uh, uh, preparatory surgery and uh, died after that. Uh, what what time are you leaving for the, to go to the front? It's it's Sunday, you say, huh? Yes, and it's what at time? twelve thirty. So I'm going to leave about eleven hmm. in in Annapolis. Oh, hmm. um, is is it is it on Zoom too? Uh no. At least as far as I know. I'd like to go. See, I don't know if I have the. Let's see if I can pull up the address real quick. I I still have the uh, email that you sent us. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. I was hoping to go. Sunday is tough for me because we I sing Sunday also. Hmm. He was a faithful hmm. member of our team, and we we miss him, and I think of him all often. Uh, and, uh, I think most of you remember Kevin. Yeah, yeah, because he was uh, outspoken as well. He he belonged. <laughs> yeah. Doctor Callender, this is Rochelle. I'm celebrating eight years cancer free. Wonderful, Thanks. wonderful. And as John was talking about uh, early detection, mine was just because I have my annual appointments every year at the same time. And that's how they caught mine for early detection because I had stage um, one. Wonderful. wonderful. Breast cancer. Wonderful, wonderful. Glad to hear that, yeah. Uh, Dr. Callender, and FYI, at our Washington Teachers Union Retirement Chapter, uh, how we had a wonderful, excellent presentations uh, with lunch <laughs> of uh, from Howard University. Of a lot of staff came to um, do presentation, and one of the things that they're going to send back to me, so John, so I can put it in the newsletter, is that they're often different cancer screening, including lung cancer screening. Good, 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 great. Happy to hear that. Happy to hear that. Okay. Well, you folks have a nice weekend, and uh, uh, we'll think of Kevin and his family. And uh, I, I hope I can find a way I can I can make it to the funeral. Yeah!